John chapter number 8, the more I know you, the more I want to know you, Jesus, more of you. Now, at the end of everything and at the end of this life, we will realize that all there was to know was Jesus. I will say that again. At the end of this life, we will realize that all there was to know was Jesus. Nothing more, nothing else. It was Jesus. I know, um, you know, so many inventions, so many inventions. And um, Baba will tell us in Ecclesiastes chapter number seven, almost the last, the last verse in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter number, chapter number seven. Before the book of Isaiah, I have I have Ecclesiastes and the Songs of Solomon. So now, Ecclesiastes chapter number seven. So quickly, I would read this. I believe with all my heart, it is verse number twenty-nine. That law, this only have I found, that God has made man upright, but they have sought out many inventions. That this only have I found, that God has made man upright, complete, full, but man many inventions no matter Jesus told them that you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free our Christianity mainly has been based on practices do's and don'ts but we have really not you know dug so deeper and to reveal the person of the Lord Jesus Christ that we would know his own father who is our father because he tells us to pray our father so now we've been seeking to know the father and in the course of our journey the father referred us to the son and that is what we've been doing this week because the son tells us in Matthew eleven twenty seven that no one knows the son apart from the father then he says also no one knows the son no one knows the father apart from the Son. So this tells me that the Son can only be revealed by the Father. And the Father can only be revealed by the Son. And Jesus says, and to those whom Jesus chooses to reveal the Father unto. And this has been our prayer this week. That we may know Him, the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we know Him, now He reveals to us who the Father is. One of the most scary, you know, uh, portions of scripture I have read is in Matthew chapter number 7. Matthew chapter number 7, one of the most scary scriptures I have read. It is not about the beast. No, no, no. It is not about the, the, the seven horsemen of the apocalypse or whatever number they are. No, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. No. It's in Matthew chapter number 7. And verse number 21. He says, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that does the will of my Father, which is in heaven. He that does the will of my Father, who is in heaven. He says in verse number 22, that many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have we not cast out devils? And in thy name... Have we not done many wonderful works? And then Jesus says, I will profess unto them. I will pronounce unto them. I will say unto them. I will declare unto them. I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that worketh iniquity. I find that, that very fearsome. I, I find that like, like uh, my generation will say, it, it freaks me out. The people that were doing miracles, you know, um, people that were prophesying, people that were casting out devils, and people that were doing many wondrous things, the miraculous, that Jesus will look at unto them straight in the face and tell them, I never knew you. I never knew you because they never did the will of his father who is in heaven. So one of the questions that has been like the question of all the ages has been how can I know God's will? I think I have an answer this afternoon. I can know and you can know God's will by knowing his son. 
Because his son is his will. Because the Bible is a movie that is building up from Genesis, but the climax of it all is the birth, is the life, is the crucifixion, is the burial, is the resurrection, and the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every other thing that happened, I believe it should be Romans chapter number 15 and verse number 4. Every other thing that happened prior to Christ, says this in Romans 15 verse number 4, for whatsoever things were written aforetime, were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. That whatever was written, was written that we may have patience. He says, now the God of patience and comfort you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus. That you may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God told the serpent that the seed of the woman. God told um, you know, Moses that I will raise a prophet like you for them. In Deuteronomy chapter number, I believe chapter number 18, verse number 15, they're about. That I will raise a prophet like you for them. He speaks to Isaiah, he says, For you know, uh, for, for a virgin shall be with the child. And they shall call his name Emmanuel. So you realize that, that, that prior to the coming of Christ, everything is setting the stage. Zechariah sets the stage for the coming of Christ. David sets the stage for the coming of Christ. So at the end of everything, at the end of everything in life, we will know that Jesus was all that mattered in life. That Jesus was all that mattered in life. Everything we see in the Old Testament, from the sacrifices, from the feasts, you know, from everything that we see in the Old Testament, the altars, everything we see, the burnt sacrifices, the burnt offerings, the wave offerings, everything that we see in the Old Testament, the coming to the prophets, and everything was setting the stage for the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to say this. We are in Him who is true. We are in Him that, that is the completeness, the fulfillment of everything that is why jesus told them i have not come to abolish the law no how can i abolish that which is the foundation that which is you know that which was to introduce me how can i abolish it because if, I, if he abolished the law then it means he is standing on nothing but he starts on the law and he says I, I have come to fulfill i have come to fulfill the law so when we receive the revelation of the lord jesus christ and gave up our earthly life and our sinful life and received his forgiveness. We received everything there was to receive in life. I want to say this. There is nothing higher than the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no revelation higher than the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not knowing people's phone numbers by mind. No. Not knowing when people will deliver the exact date, the exact, the exact month, the exact week, the exact day, even the exact hour and the exact minute, even the exact second and nukta. No. The highest revelation about everything else is the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, in John chapter number 16, verse number 15, I believe we've read this in the course, in the course of this week. Uh, and he's talking about the Holy Ghost and he says that when he comes he will take that which is mine and make it known to you. He says now all things that the Father has are mine. Therefore I say he shall take of mine and he shall show it unto you. So the Lord Jesus is the fulfillment of everything in life. Just flip one, one page to chapter number 19 verse number 28 of the same book of John. John chapter number 19. And verse number 28, he says, That after this, Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. What scriptures? Scripture. Every prophecy that had been spoken about the Savior, be it him entering into Jerusalem, riding on the young one of a donkey, be it him being born of a virgin, a bath, be it him, you know, coming into the temple, which is the house of his father, be it him going to the cross, be it even his resurrection. Everything about Christ, every scripture, every prophecy, every psalm, even what he was to say on that cross, Psalm 22. My father, my father, why have you forsaken me? Everything. The Bible says, and him knowing 
that all things you are now accomplished. Child of God, Jesus is the highest revelation. It is not money. It is not prosperity. I know we love prosperity. It is not the highest revelation. Jesus is a supreme revelation. I know we love casting out devils. Casting out devils is nothing. There are people that are casting out devils and Jesus will say he did not know them. Don't ask me how. But he will say, get out of my face. I never knew. There are people that are stopping even the waves. They are doing wondrous works. There are people that are changing their suits as they preach because of miracles. But he will say, I never knew you. Please underline, by now we are mature in the spirit. We know not every person that is casting out de devils is, 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 is deceptive. No. Not every person that is working miracles is deceptive. No. But we are saying, where the revelation in a church, and let me not even use the word church, where the revelation in a denomination, or where the revelation in a gathering, is anything else apart from Christ that is defective? When the revelation, the highest revelation in that church is the man of God, the woman of God, our prophet, that revelation is defective. Casting down every mind and every thought that exalts themselves above the knowledge of God. When what gathers people in that denomination and in that sanctuary is the miracles. It is not the person of Christ. We have missed it. He told them in Matthew chapter number 10, verse number 7 and 8. As you go preach faith, not preach the gospel. No, he says preach faith, gospel. The gospel is specific. It is about the kingdom and the king. Or if you want in, in, in order of hierarchy, it is about the king and his kingdom. I will say that again. That the true gospel is about the king and the kingdom. Romans 1 verse number 16, Paul will say that I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God unto salvation. He does not say I'm not ashamed of the gospels. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And the gospel is about the king and the kingdom. Now, let me finish my introduction by saying this. That as a believer, the concentration of my belief, the foundation of my faith must be anchored on these two. The king and the kingdom. Every other thing, like someone will say back in the years, is fish cakes. That means it's, it's, it's absolutely a waste of time. Now, by the way, if you did not know, I have notes here and I'm supposed to give you eight points. I'm supposed to give you eight points on the priority of knowing Christ for us to know the Father. Eight points. And it is now quarter to two. Quarter to two. It's happening almost every day, but it is okay. Now, now, the more I know you, the more I want to know you because Jesus is everything there is to know. Now, see this child of God. The concentration of the life of every believer must be those two things, the king and the kingdom. Now, I want to bring this to every one of us. Muslims are rich. We can't argue with that. You can't argue with facts. You can't argue with something that you can see unless you're looking for a fight. They are rich. But they don't honor the king and they don't operate by kingdom principles. So this tells me that Christianity has to do with something higher than money. It has something to do with something higher than building houses. It has something to do with, you know, it, it has to do with things higher than buying vehicles. It has something to do with, you know, it is higher than air travel. It is higher than buying a helicopter for our man of God or our man of God. It has something to do with, it is higher than the material things. Jesus tells them, one time they are like, Master, we want to go with you. He tells them, the son of man has no place to lay his head. The foxes have holes, the birds have nests. But the son of man has no earthly possession. He has nothing that ties him here on the earth. I must say this with a lot of shame. That it is a shame that Christianity in our day is highlighted, is defined 
by how much money we have, by how the quality and the caliber of the vehicles that we drive, you know, and everything earthly and everything worldly. It's a shame. If I would ask, what did Peter have? What did John have? Bible tells me in Luke chapter number 5, when Jesus comes and does the miracle on the lake Gensaret, and um, you know they have a great you know hole of fish until their you know their boats were breaking. Bible says, and Peter and Andrew, his brother, and then John and, and James, they left everything and they followed him. That if they were taught to declare their wealth, the only wealth they have was Jesus, what Jesus said, he said, and I will make you fishers of men. So the only wealth they carry was the souls of men. But right now, even during this COVID season, most of us don't care about people that don't know Christ. We care about our businesses. We care about our working places. Because that is what we have relegated Christianity to become. About money, about wealth, about prosperity. You can lose everything in this life. Maintain Jesus. Maintain Jesus. See, the Bible will tell us in Hebrews step number 11. Don't forget, I still have eight points. I have eight points. Alfie is looking at me like, really, like you're going to preach eight points. And now where you are and the way we know you. Now, Hebrews uh, chapter number 11. Chapter number 11, verse number 35. Chapter number 11, verse number 36. this. If I start from verse number 32, and one more would I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David. That he doesn't even have time to tell us about David. He doesn't even have time to tell us about Samuel. Or even Samson. And he says this in verse number 33. Who through faith, they subdued kingdoms. They walked righteousness. They obtained promises. They stopped the mouths of life. They quenched the violence of the fire. They escaped the edge of the sword. Out of weakness, they were made strong. They waxed valiant in fight. They waxed valiant in fight. They turned to fly the armies of the aliens. It says this verse about, you know, verse, verse number, verse number 35. Women received their dead priests uh, back to life. And others were tortured, accepting deliverance, not accepting deliverance, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had a trial of cruel mockings and scourges. Yet, moreover, bones and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sown asunder. They were tempted. They were slain with the sword. They wandered about in the city, afflicted and tormented. Notice verse number 38, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and in caves of the earth. And these all having obtained a good report through faith, though they never received the promise. Child of God. Look at what defines these children of God. Battles. They were sown into two. They went through scourges. They went through persecution. Look at everything they went through. Fight. Look at everything they went through. Lions along the way. Look at everything that they went through. Cruel mocking, scourges. You know, moreover, they went through ports and imprisonment. But look at our generation today. One of the issues that has, that has divided almost every person now that calls themselves Christians is the issue of when should the sanctuaries be reopened because there are those who feel we need to accept the status quo and there are those who feel faith is persecution at its own you know it's the birth pangs of persecution but there are men who knew this Jesus and they left everything and they followed him Christianity cannot be Highlighted, it cannot be referenced for the rest of our days with almost every other good thing. Doesn't Paul tell us, you know, he's speaking to Timothy and he tells Timothy that every person at right around, I think, first Timothy 3 12 or second Timothy 3 12, he says that every man and every woman that desires to live a godly life in Christ must go through persecution. But we are doing everything we can. To avoid persecution. Life. We are doing everything we can to preach in the US. We are doing everything we can to drive the latest car. 
But when he comes, what shall we make present? What shall we present before him? Paul says to the church in Corinth that you are our letter. He says that you are our letter. He says that when that day comes, that we shall stand before God. And Paul prays that he shall not be ashamed for the investment he had made into the church that was in Corinth. Child of God, this Jesus, we must know him. And it is not all sugar and butter, no. It's not all bread and butter, no. No, no. Look at what defines they that believed in Christ. The imprisonment. Paul says that he has, you know, undergone alone as an apostle, the maximum of an apostle. Uh, why in his life, why he even says in the book of Galatians, let no man trouble me. I bear in my body the marks of Christ. What were the marks of Christ in his body? The beatings, the jail terms, the imprisonment. The shipwrecks, the many times that they had left him for dead, even in the book of Acts of the Apostles, they beat him and they thought he was dead and they left. Then he revived and he continued to go back to the next city and started preaching. What do we have to show for our belief in this Jesus Christ? I believe with all my heart that we have made a presentation of this gospel that is all, you know, bread and butter. But we have avoided what would become to us the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ in our body. Let the church in my generation hear. We will not make marks advance into the world the way we are right now. We must be willing, we must be ready to be persecuted for him. We must be willing, we must be ready. You know, what do you make of James chapter number 1, verse number 12, I believe? The blessed is the man that endures temptation. You know, another version will say that count it all joy. You know, count it all joy when you go through diverse temptations. You know, count it all joy. When will that time come? Jesus says that time is coming that when they that persecute you, they will think. That they're giving a sacrifice unto God. Paul says that I may know him. That I may know him. The knowledge of Christ has it, it is on it is not only defined by the cars that we drive, the houses that we build, the nations that we travel unto, how we change our wardrobe every three months, you know, how tall or how long our shoes are. That is not the definition of our knowing this Christ and we have put so many believers in undue stress because they know Jesus they are saved but they don't have the vehicles they know Jesus but they don't have the wardrobe they are forgiven of their sins they know that they know that they know Jesus but they don't have the worldly affluence that we live in and they are so stressed because they think they have known the tail of Jesus and we have known the head of Jesus. We have misrepresented this gospel. Am I saying that cars and wealth and everything are not, and we are not entitled to them? No. At your right heart, there are pleasures forevermore. But they were not the priority. Matthew chapter number 6, verse number 33. Matthew chapter number 6 and verse number 33. He will tell us this. If you start, if you start from verse number 31, 29 says, And later I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Talking about the lilies of the field. Verse number 30, wherefore, if God has clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven. Shall he not much more clothe thee, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or, where, or with what shall we be clothed? He says this in verse number 32. For after all these things, the Gentiles do seek. The Muslims are seeking after them. 
They monkeys, they're seeking after them. The Subuzu, they're seeking after them. The Hindus, they're seeking after them. The Orca, they're, they're seeking after them. The Athens, they look, they're seeking after them. He says this, but to those of us are in Christ, our Heavenly Father knows that we have need of all these things. He's not calling us to laziness. He is calling us to confidence. Then he says in verse number 33, but as far as you are concerned, but ye, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Who is the righteousness of the kingdom? The king. The Bible says that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Jehovah our righteousness. That seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added. And that's all I've been saying this afternoon. That our knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ will prioritize the key and the kingdom. Then the houses, the cars, the international travel. If you want to take your shoe every three hours, it is okay. But first, seek ye first the kingdom and his righteousness. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. In his righteousness. If we desire to know the Father, have a relationship with the Father, it is, it is needful for us that we prioritize the King and the Kingdom. That we prioritize the King and the Kingdom. I know maybe for so many will be this is a waste this is a waste of a whole week because we have not prayed for you to have money we have not prayed for you to change your job we've not prayed for you to relocate from the estate where you are right now we have not even prayed for your business to move from the level where it is to the other level but what shall it profit a man if you gain the entire life gain the entire business gain the entire relationships gain the entire wealth but you lose your own life to him who has, more will be given. To him who has the hunger to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst. Matthew 5 verse number 8. For righteousness, for they shall be filled. We must prioritize and we must. I remember when I was growing up. The church where I grew up, I may not consider it spiritual. Because we never considered it spiritual. Because they never jumped like we jump. They never spoke in tongues like we speak in tongues. You know, they never, they never, they never, they never, they never. They never sang closing their eyes like we do. They never, you know, soaked like we soak. So we never consider them spiritual. But I know better right now. I know better right now. I know better right now. Most of what they taught me was the worship of God, the fear of God, you know, the preparation to go to heaven. How to stay in peace and love with my fellow neighbors. That was all they were teaching. That love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And that preaching was taught in different approaches. But bottom line, they taught about heaven consistently, how to prepare for heaven. They taught me on how to stay with people at peace with all people. They kept teaching me that. They kept teaching me that. And you look at them until now, they still have a high regard for the Lord Jesus Christ. They may not know much about him, but the minimum they know, they have maintained it. They have stood the test of time. We must prioritize the knowledge of the king and the knowledge of the kingdom than the wealth, than the money, than the houses, than the vehicles, than the class, you know, than the social status. We must prioritize. We must prioritize. But our generation has been defined by the gymnastics that comes with Christianity. I was in a meeting prior to this lunch hour and um, one senior person, you know, say that uh, one of the reasons and one of the tough things that we are facing as a nation from, you know, the government and um uh, so on and so forth is the Pentecostals because we are not to be in discipline and they don't know how to regulate us because we can't regulate ourselves it's not how Jesus would have wanted us to be known 
the selling of the oil, the selling of the soil, the selling of the soil. Is that how Jesus would have wanted us to be known? As he is, so are we. Are we the way he is? He never sold any soil. He never sold any anointing oil. He never demanded for people to give him any money. For him to perform any miracle. No, he performed. He says, as you, you know, freely you have received, freely give. Another chapter number 10. If we are intentional on knowing the Father, we must know the Son. And he is the King. And he is the King of the kingdom. He owns the field. He owns the estate. And Father, this is our prayer. That we would know your Son. That we will know Jesus. I will say it again. At the end of everything on this life. We will see and we will know. That the only thing that. The only thing that mattered. Was the Lord Jesus Christ. Was the Lord Jesus Christ. That there is no other. There isn't a higher revelation. Save from knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know him? You may be listening to this some of this hour and you do not know him. You've followed religion, you followed you followed denominations, you follow people, but you have not known the Lord Jesus Christ. You have not known the Lord. Yes, you go to church, you give your money, but you have not known him. This is my prayer that you would know him, whom to know is eternal life. Salvation has nothing to do with the denomination, no. Salvation is a relationship. That at the moment where I allow and I agree to be saved, I'm saying I want to be engaged to the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to be hooked up with Christ. If you do not know, if you don't have that relationship with him, we'll pray for you this afternoon. Kindly get into our inbox or give us your number right there. We'll check it out and we will call you. And we'll open up this gospel of Christ into your life. We don't need you in our church, no. We need you in the body of Christ. But you can look for a law fearing church, Bible teaching church, where they can teach you in a man of God that submits to the king and operates by kingdom principles. Father, we pray in the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ that your word would enter into our souls, that your light would shine, illuminate, and Father, push back every darkness, push back every ignorance push back every lack of knowledge and father that you will save us from damnation you will save us from perishing i pray mighty god in your own divine wisdom you gave us your son the lord jesus christ i pray help us to know him help us to know him as the deep call it unto the deep father i pray that you will take us deeper launch us deeper into him he has already said with all audacity that everything that the Father has, it has been given into his hand. Everything we want to know, everything we want to have from you, it is in his hand. Precious Jesus, I pray, as the Bible tells us in John 21, that you revealed yourself again to the disciples. Reveal yourself to us, precious Lord Jesus. In the dreams of the night, in the visions of the day, in your word, in your voice, through the preachings of your word, through the songs that are being sung, we pray. Whatever it takes, Lord Jesus, reveal yourself to us. Reveal yourself to us. That there is more, there is more to us knowing you than just the money and the wealth and the social status and the achievements in this world. There is more. There is more. I pray that in our generation, reveal yourself to us like you did to Paul, like you did to Philip, like you did to Peter, like you did to John the Revelator, that even as they were here on the earth, they saw things, they had things, that they were not even able to conceptualize into words. They couldn't even tell us what they had. I pray, as Enoch walked with the Lord and he was known, that we would walk with him. You have created an avenue that we will be able to know you. I pray that, Father, you will deliver us from religion. You will deliver us from our denominations. You will deliver us from routines. 
And we pray like you did in John chapter number 2, precious Jesus. And you drove out they that were merchandising in the house of your father. I pray that you would cleanse, that you would cleanse in our day. And that the revelation of the father will become crystal clear to every one of us. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. For tuning into this complex broadcast this week, when the Lord allows, will come back and make promises that the Lord will do, the Lord will do. But I believe with all my heart, I don't see Him doing the Lord will do, the Lord will do, He has already done. You would learn how this kingdom operates, and the rest of your life will be pure bliss. Lord bless your afternoon. We'll see you again tomorrow in Jesus' name, amen.